All right. Welcome, everybody. It is 3.02. I am two minutes late. I can't stand when that happens. Uh, but we are all lavaliered up. We've got our microphones working, and we've got a great panel here for you today. Um, we have um, a, a small but mighty audience here uh, in person who uh, think will continue to grow. We've got a lovely room uh, here and some sunshine shining in. We've got a nice, wide, and diverse audience joining online today. Super excited about that. Um, so hopefully you guys uh, who are joining us online will uh, hashtag CTE identity is where you can join the conversation and you can send us your questions when we get to that portion of the, um, of the, of the show and tell. Uh, but please do uh, join us uh, in the conversation because it's going to be a good one. So welcome to our event today. It's called, Is Career in Technical Education Having an Identity Crisis? Um, and it's a, it's a good question. We think it's going to stir a lot of good debate and discussion today. We're thrilled at Fordham to host this conversation, especially as we know both K-12 and post-secondary institutions are seeing a renewed focus on how to prepare students for what comes after high school. And CTE can obviously play a big part in that. Um, if I didn't introduce myself, did I? Anyway, I'm Amber Northern. I'm the S uh, SVP for research here at Fordham. Um, at Fordham, we've been conducting research on uh, CTE for a, a little while now, trying to kind of help uh, folks figure out what CTE is all about, how to strengthen it, um, how to make sure that kids are getting the most benefit out of it. Um, and we're seeing, you know, several challenges along the way. We're not, we're not unique in that, but that's part of what this session's all about today. We've, we think that CT sometimes appears to us at least to have multiple purposes and goals. And honestly, we're seeing very little high quality CTE programming nationally. Uh, we do see some bright spots and some of those, those folks are here today to share like what this is what we're doing in, in, in our states and localities and this is some good stuff you're gonna hear about today. But speaking broadly, there's a lot of room we think for, um, for you know, pushing the ball down the court in terms of high quality CTE programming. We still see not only in our study but others, very few quote concentrators uh, in the CTE landscape, you know, taking multiple courses in a sequence that kind of, you know, plays, builds on itself uh, and really prepares kids. So we feel like CTE is getting a lot of attention, but there's a lot of room for growth. And so sometimes it's really not clear, you know, kind of what we mean by CTE. Do we think that we want all kids taking traditional college prep with maybe a little CTE on the side? Or do we think we want kids to sort of, quote, choose a pathway and maybe spend their last couple years of high school really digging into serious industry prep? Um, it just seems to us and to, to some others that there's a lot of confusion still around what the purposes of CTE is. Is it trying to be all things to all kids? And is that really possible? And, and if we think it should be, then how do we get there? Those are the types of questions we're going to dig into today. Um, we just really want to think about how to make these programs uh, stronger, and, and we know sometimes that's hard to get it right. So I'm going to ask our ex experts a number of questions today that are intended to address these questions that get at the real purpose and the real identity of CTE. I anticipate that some of them are going to see these questions uh, differently, which is great, and that's going to make for a much uh, more robust and interesting discussion. Uh, but again, the, the goal is really to try to improve uh, CT programs, which is what we, we all care and want. I'm joined today by an incredible panel. Uh, they have a diverse background in CTE. I'm going to refer to them briefly by name and affiliation now. But in a minute, they're going to be introducing themselves, and they're going to be telling you a little bit more about the work that they do and the organizations they represent. Um, I think uh, what you're going to find is that they hail from research, industry, policy making, and the school building and state department sectors. So we've got, a, we've got all these different angles, and it's going to become really interesting uh, to you guys as you hear them speak because they look at CTE from different lenses. Um, and that's what makes this, this panel really, really interesting. So in ABC order, um, we've got Sandra Clement, who's the principal from Foy H. Moody High School. We've got Kay Kramer, who's the deputy executive director at Advanced CTE. We've got Romanita Mata Barrera, who's the executive director of SA San Antonio Works, EVP of Workforce Development at the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. We've got Cameron Sublett, who's the Associate Professor of Education at Pepperdine University. And we've got Kylie Whitaker, who's the Associate Assistant Director, rather, of Office of Career and Technical Education and Student Transitions at the Kentucky Department of Education. 
Uh, we're going to start in a minute with Dr. Sublett, who's going to do a 10-minute presentation on his latest study that he co-authored with Fordham's David Griffith. It's called How Aligned is Career and Technical Education to Local Labor Markets. Uh, we had the pleasure of working with Cameron on the study that we released last month. Uh, and, and really, the study breaks new ground in its examination of whether students in high school CTE programs are more likely to take courses in high demand and or high wage industries. Uh, he looked at this question nationally and locally. After Cameron goes, it's going to work like this. I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves briefly. I'm going to pose the same question to the panel, which kind of relates to this what's CT all about kind of, kind of focus. And I'm going to ask them to respond to that question as well as introduce themselves, hopefully within five minutes, because we <laughs> like to keep things moving. Um, and then I'm going to ask a specific question, probably of each panelist. Uh, we'll see how time, time goes. Um, and I, that will be more directed to their particular experience. And then we're going to hopefully have people jump in. We really want this to be a conversation, and we were actually hoping that we could do the chairs differently and have them facing each other, but we're going to make the best of it like this because we want it to be a discussion. We don't want it just to be this stilted thing. So we're going to try to get them to engage with each other um, and, of course, with you guys. Um, and so this is not so scripted and stilted. I'm going to save ample time at the end for discussion uh, and audience questions as well. So uh, if I don't, Madison, say stop. Uh, if, if we find that we haven't saved enough time because we want to do that. Um, I think that's it. Did I forget anything? Is some, no. All right. Cameron, you are up. Excellent. Test the mic. Can everybody hear me? All right. Okay, great. So I have 10 minutes with you uh, at the outset here to discuss a report that uh, I recently co-authored with David Griffith in the room here um, from Fordham. And we're really excited about this report. As Amber said, we feel strongly that it does break uh, some new ground um, with regard to its methodology. Um, with regard to its findings, I think if you read the report, uh, you'll find that it opens up many more questions than it closes. But with the time I have with you right now, I will generally summarize that report. So uh, first thing we did, uh, David and I, is we identified what we perceived to be a gap in the existing literature um, around this largely held and espoused assumption that students are or should be taking CTE courses in high school in a manner that aligns with their lo local labor markets. And this assumption is quite ubiquitous in the public dialogue around CTE. It's also in the legislative language, but uh, as far as we could determine, we didn't notice any existing empirical research into this assumption. And so that's what we were really trying to do with this study, hence the study's title, How Aligned is Career and Technical Education to Local Labor Markets. So we asked three primary research questions in this study. These research questions are up on the screens there for you. First, we wanted to know to what extent does the national CTE course taking patterns reflect the distribution of jobs across fields and industries? So in other words, are students taking classes writ large that resemble or mirror the jobs that are available? Um, second, we wanted to see to what extent CTE course, in, course taking is linked to local employment and industry wages. And then third, we wanted to see how patterns of CTE participation, course taking, concentration, differed or varied systematically by student subpopulations such as gender and race or ethnicity. And so what I'll do in the next eight minutes or so now is cover these, uh, the findings that we have um, for these particular research questions. First though, uh, how did we do this study? This in many respects rep represents one of the great contributions of this work, we feel. Uh, we needed data uh, relating to students course taking in high school, but we also needed data related to, student, uh, to the lo local labor markets in those students' surrounding areas. And uh, this represented quite the task, quite the challenge. So first things first, student course taking. We accessed a panel of nationally representative 
high school students. Uh, this uh, data panel was gathered by the National Center for Education Statistics. In particular, we got access to the restricted version of the high school longitudinal study, which tracks uh, a cohort of roughly 23,000 high school students from 2009 and to 2012. And if you've ever worked with these data, you know that in addition to being nationally representative, they're quite rich, tons of demographic information for each individual student observation. But um, most importantly, for the purposes of this study, there was transcript data also available. In other words, we knew every single class every student took in the HSLS study. So that allowed us then to identify <coughs> the types of CTE courses students were taking throughout high school. Um, now, on the other side of the ledger, we also needed information pertaining to labor markets. And so that was not available through NCES, but it was available through publicly available data supplied by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, specifically the Occupational Employment Statistics, or BLS. Now, the BLS data we got access to um, did not naturally marry the NCES data we had. So we had to do some data manipulation to make that work. Specifically, we, what we needed to do is get the NCES data to translate in CTE clusters, which we're all pretty much familiar with in this room, I would imagine. These are the 16 CTE clusters if you're not familiar with them. We wanted to take CTE course taking, break it out into the 16 CTE clusters, but then we also needed labor market data in those same 16 CTE clusters. And so NCES provided course codes for each course the student took. We could then naturally align that into the career clusters framework through NCES's own dictionary. BLS was another story. They provide labor market information based on SOC, Standard Occupational Classification. We found a crosswalk supplied by the National Research Center for Career and Technical Education. I want to give them a big shout out in this presentation because without that crosswalk, this study would have not been possible. That crosswalk allowed us to, in short, merge student level observations uh, together um, with Bureau of Labor Statistics, data, uh, occupational employment statistics. So a really powerful, robust data sample that we're hoping that future researchers will see our model, how we made this work, and then run off and do more future studies. You're probably wondering though at this point, what were <laughs> our findings, what were the findings? So first, where are the jobs? Well, the jobs are in overall four fields. We found that half of the jobs in the U.S. are in one of four fields, uh, BM, HOSP, Mark, MAN. In other words, business management and administration, hospitality and tourism, marketing and manufacturing. So the lion's share of jobs in the overall U.S. market could be classified into those real, those four clusters there. You can see that there is employment in government, right? Um, agriculture, food, and natural resources, or STEM, but those don't constitute a very large or substantial proportion of the overall U.S. labor market. We're really talking about um, domination from these four clusters. Now, here's the, uh, the other question. What is the CTE course taking that we observed? Well, we observed CTE course taking dominated by four clusters, but not necessarily the same clusters. We saw CTE course taking in HSLS dominated by IT, so information technology, business management, um, arts, uh, AV technology and communication, and agriculture, food, and natural resources. So there is some evidence of alignment, but I think you'll agree with me that if you compare here, you know, what we saw from the jobs and the courses, that there is not systematic alignment. It's not like we're assuming a one-to-one -one proportionality, right? Like for every 1% increase in business management, we should see you know, students taking business management courses, but we should see some uh, you know, assemblage, some, some sort of pattern, but we didn't notice it. We didn't even notice it in concentrations either. You can see here that concentrations were dominated by health science, agriculture, food, and natural resources, architecture and construction, and information technology as well. So to the first research question we asked, how does the distribution of jobs align with the distribution of CTE course taking? We would say, not really. Is there an alignment? Kind of, but it's not clear. It's not <laughs> systematic. One would hope and one would expect from reading the legislation, from the public rhetoric discourse around alignment, there'd be more, but we didn't see it. The second research question was intriguing as well. It asked, to what degree is local labor markets wages, employment associated with CTE course taking. 
And this is a little bit of good news. We found that as the overall, the, as the fraction of employment in a particular CTE area increases, CTE course taking in that same cluster also increases. So in other words, as the fraction of, let's say, for example, STEM employment in a student's metropolitan statistical area increases, the probability that a student will take a class in that same cluster increases. Okay, so that is evidence of alignment. That is evidence that students are taking courses in a manner that suits their surrounding labor market demands. What we didn't expect to find, though, is this association, namely that as wages in a particular cluster increased, probabilities of CTE course taking in that same cluster decreased. In other words, as the field became more and more remunerative, the probability of a student taking courses within that cluster decreased. Of course, we would surmise or hypothesize that if there's higher wages in a cluster, then students would be drawn to course taking in that cluster, but we did not observe that. And we hypothesize why that might be in the report. I won't speculate just right now as a, out of respect for time. Um, to the third research question, was there systematic stratification, variation, uh, differentiation by race and gender? Gender, yes. Uh, and this was a pretty robust finding in all of our statistical models. We found that even controlling for a whole host of rich covariates that might explain CTE consumption, we found systematic differences between males and females in the CTE courses that they took. And these differences fell along kind of traditional gender lines. Um, for instance, we found that males were more likely to engage CTE clusters associated with science, STEM, uh, traditionally male-dominated occupations, architecture and construction, whereas females tended to engage CTE clusters that were traditionally or stereotypically, I might add, feminine, such as human services, arts, education, health sciences. Now, with regard to race and ethnicity, we did observe some variation. As you can see here, there was some variation between CTE course taking among white, black, Hispanic students within the HSLS sample. But I do want to highlight that these differences that are visually represented right now were not statistically significant. So these variant, these, this variation that you're observing could just be due to random noise, sampling error, whatever it might be. We're not comfortable drawing firm conclu con uh, conclusions here that there is systematic differences by race and ethnicity, although descriptively, it does appear that that is the case. So some caveats with our study. Um, we list these in the <coughs> written report, which we and would encourage you all to read. We're dealing with relatively older data. Recall that this is a cohort of students that proceeded through the high school pipeline in 2009 to 2012. CTE has evolved markedly since then. Um, we also um, would like to would note that you know there's some issues around course coding. You know just because a course is coded as CTE. After that, um, we, we dug a little bit deeper and started to ask, well, what exactly are these courses that students are taking that are classified as CTE? And now we're kind of curious about, well, how do those course codes actually re reflect and resemble um, what actually what we think to be CTE? Um, we had problems with um, concentration. As you know, that different states define concentration differently. We defined concentration as the completion of three courses, right? Um, but not all states use that same operationalization. So there was some caveats with the study. Um, going back to the course code thing, I just wanted to highlight a one follow-up analysis that I've done since the study, because I was just so intrigued, and you don't have to make sense of this just right now. <laughs> but um, I did highlight, I, I did go back into the data, and I wanted to see what courses were dominant with, within each cluster. And um, I, I found that there were certain clusters that the overwhelming majority or lion's share of the course taking was just one or two courses. And in IT, that was, uh, that was business applications. So this was essentially like Microsoft Office tutorial classes. So then that begs the question um, to the larger panel and purpose here today, which is, is CDE having an identity crisis, right? I think that um, if you were to poll the, the, the populace, uh, 
uh, the, the, you know, the average person familiar with CTE, they wouldn't necessarily associate IT with Microsoft Word, right? Um, in manufacturing, you can see here um, course taking was dominated by a few specific courses. Um, one, of, one of those, that the largest bar there was wood shop, right? So is that CTE and is that really the pathway to a good job, right? Um, so um, the takeaways from the study, there's clearly potential for greater alignment in most fields. Uh, there is some evidence we uncovered of alignment, but we don't really know why that alignment is the case, if that alignment is merely spurious, okay? Um, what we would like to see is future researchers compile the data as we did uh, maybe even better, and uh, investigate the find findings that we report here and maybe novel ways to shed additional light. I think um, I look forward to our panel discussion today about alignment. What does that even mean? What is the purpose of alignment? Um, and I'm sure we'll get into some of the inequities that we uncovered in the report there too. But um, I would encourage you all to go and read the report. We look forward to your feedback and are happy to make what we feel is a strong contribution, but we're happy to be here in this room to have a larger discussion about what this means and where do we go from here. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, so the question I'm gonna pose to each one of you and while you're introducing yourselves is this sort of big question that's, that's the title of the event, which is what is the purpose of CTE, in your opinion? Is it best viewed as general education for all or industry-specific training for particular careers? That's some of the questions in there. Should all students be exposed to some form of high school CTE or just some students? All right, uh, Romanita, I'm gonna start with you if you'll introduce yourself. I know you've got a few slides as well and try to tackle that question. You got it. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Romanita Matamarrara. I serve as the executive director of Save Works, and I don't know if we could bring up my slides now. Yeah, that would be perfect. Cameron, you can share your screen. Oh, thank you. Uh, we were um, initially founded to complement what was potentially lacking in our school districts in San Antonio, and that was work-based learning opportunities that would help really clarify pathways for students. Uh, through job shadowing, paid internships, and, and other, other meaningful work-based learning opportunities. And we started to really see uh, it gain traction with our private sector. I think to a lot of the points that Cameron made, if we want uh, CTE to help fill uh, or CTE courses and students to see the opportunity and hopefully we'll, we'll help address your question two or three, how can CTE courses lead students to take on higher paying jobs, that's essentially what we have been working on in San Antonio through our partnership with our school districts. And so the SA Works is an industry-led organization. We focus on workforce. As I mentioned earlier, our specific focus was on just K-12 engagement, but we have grown our focus since then. But we are specifically targeting very key industries that offer high-skilled, high-paying high jobs. And because of the fact that we are a workforce entity that sits within the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. It's very important to us that we are working early on to cultivate uh, the, the talent that's needed in our target industries. And so our strategic framework within economic development in San Antonio is business attraction. We want to bring high paying jobs to San Antonio, but then we also want to ensure that we retain and help expand the companies that we already have there. And when we look back to their number one priority for a company that we want to recruit or a company that we want to keep and retain, aside from incentives or abatements, it is really workforce. They want to know that if they relocate their businesses to our community in San Antonio, that we're gonna have the prepared workforce they need today, but they also want to know what's in that pipeline five, 10, 15 years from now. How are our school districts performing and what are the, what are the degree and certificate and programs of study that are aligning to their needs. And so we have some target industries that you see there, advanced manufacturing, we have Toyota there. And so with uh, automotive manufacturing, you not only have Toyota as the, as the anchor uh, employer, but a really robust 
supplier network, and we also have a very strong food manufacturing uh, component to that, all of which have very similar workforce needs, uh, followed by new energy, IT, cybersecurity. We have the number one cybersecurity program, uh, degree program in the nation. We have a robust defense and commercial cybersecurity sector, and these are all high-skilled, high-paying jobs. And so we are very happy to see the growth in uh, IT, CTE programs and, and students, really. And I think to Cameron's point is we want to make sure that our CTE programs in San Antonio are aligning to our target industries, as, as noted by us uh, at the Economic Development Foundation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we are focused on growing our talent in San Antonio, what's happening in K-12, and our direct points of contact for us at, the, at San Antonio Works are the career technical education directors, their CTE directors. And by the way, we have over 15 school districts in San Antonio, so that's a lot of people and a lot of staff and a lot of high schools and a lot of different uh, high school CTE programs. But uh, we serve a very clear purpose to them. We want to facilitate industry engagement. We have the benefit of sitting within the Economic Development Foundation, and as I mentioned earlier, we have robust relationships with all of our largest and smallest and medium-sized employers in all of those target industries. And so we want to make it as easy for industry to engage with our school districts as it is for our school districts to engage with them. And realize that sometimes it doesn't come natural for some of our school districts to have those types of meaningful relationships with industry. Uh, we want to help facilitate that engagement, everything from helping them build up more robust CTE industry advisory councils. So identifying the folks that are really going to roll up their sleeves, come in and provide meaningful information and resources from uh, curriculum advice to donation of equipment and even the how to utilize that equipment as well. Uh, as well as also helping partnering with them when they're going out and seeking grants from the state and the federal government as well. We always partner with them, and uh, in Texas we have seen a big shift towards, and I'm sure everywhere, uh, partnership and collaboration with the private sector. So instead of them having, and school districts having to potentially go out to every single one of these companies, we serve as at one convener and facilitator for them. But obviously we're very much interested too, in, in addressing how we can look at our adult workforce in San Antonio as well for upskilling, retention, recruitment purposes. So I'll go very quickly on to just some of the work that we do around experiential learning. And this is really where we partner with our, with our school districts. Uh, we want to bring industry to the table wherever they can across this experiential learning continuum to really provide that exposure to students. Uh, back to camera and um, data and research, we are very intentional about ensuring that students and their parents and the educators are aware of what are the high paying jobs in San Antonio and what it's going to take to ensure that those young men and women are successful at them and also to um, demystify any misperceptions about specific industries like manufacturing. I'm sure if, you're, if you think of San Antonio, manufacturing may not have come top of mind to some of you, and that's still the case sometimes in our own hometown, and we want to make sure that uh, young women in particular, and so our private sector is very committed to ensuring Toyota in particular uh, leading the way along with many others to ensure that more females are accessing manufacturing and really just uh, learning more about the economic mobility and opportunities offered there. We also produce a jobs report um, biannually and actually uh, we have the 2019 just being released today and we make it a very simple jobs report that anyone, whether they're in high school and they're a student or they're a parent or they're uh, an adult that's transitioning careers, that they see which local employers are hiring in San Antonio in three of our target industries, manufacturing, IT, and healthcare. And I just put up manufacturing and healthcare so you could just see a quick snapshot, but it's very easy information for somebody to consume. And we're highlighting what are the educational levels required in each one of those jobs. So these are the top 10, top 10 posted jobs by our local employers, as well as the salaries, your average annual salaries that you can earn. So it really just 
helps bring to our general population as well as our post-secondary partners as well a better understanding, but also our K-12 partners at the CTE level to better understand that we can put young men and women. So a little bit to answer your question, Amber, about what is the purpose of CTE is, it is that alignment to high paying jobs and ideally put them on a path to college and career um, and, and really um, help build their technical and marketable skills, but they've got to have awareness of, around what that's going to take. So we provide a little bit more of a deeper snapshot as to which marketable skills, essential, and technical skills. So we also classify the certifications within each one of these sectors in our jobs report. So a student can really walk away with some basic knowledge. And then who are our, our top five employers in San Antonio for each of those? And so interestingly enough, we have a very large um, grocery retailer in San Antonio, HEB, or they're based out of San Antonio, but they're across Texas. And it really helps when you see HEB pop up as one of the top manufacturing employers because they are a food manufacturer, but a top IT employer because they're in e-commerce. And so it just really helps us uh, kickstart an interesting conversation with our educators and our students. Um, we do a lot of our experiential learning work. Job Shadow Day, in one single day, we mobilized around three to 4,000 students across 120 employers. And that takes real buy-in from our school districts. We worked very closely with them. Months have had a time to identify a day when juniors and seniors won't be testing, a day where they can mobilize their transportation department to take students across all of San Antonio. And then we bring to the table employers. Employers who are gonna open their doors for a half day experience to really expose these young men and women to these very interesting careers. We try to stay within our target demand industries, but we also are very uh, cognizant of the requests that we get from various CTE programs. A lot of requests for law and law enforcement, others, um, and so we try to, to, uh, to meet their, their needs as well. But just as importantly as exposing youth to industry, we also believe that there's a lot of opportunity for upskilling our our teachers and educators. And so we also partner with our school districts for a teacher externship during the summer, where they also spend a couple of, throughout a three to four week period out of their summer, they're spending some time with some of our employers to see how math and science is actually being applied in the workforce, and then how they can take that relevant, uh, that relevancy into the, into, the, uh, into the classroom and be able to create project-based learning plans as well. Just as an example in terms of uh, the engagement with our, uh, with our private sector, I mentioned Toyota earlier. These are slides taken directly from Toyota Ma Motor Manufacturing Texas, right? This is their community engagement strategy. It really takes, I believe, meaningful employer industry engagement at all levels. And you can see in the case of Toyota, they're looking way long term, right? They are engaged in our, in our uh, citywide pre-K program, they're starting very early. So they're looking at this very comprehensive workforce strategy, but I will highlight to you, they see career technical education CTE programs as part of their strategy to fill their short-term workforce needs. So that's very important. They are working very closely in partnership with some of our key CTE programs in San Antonio to really straighten them and to be able to be more responsive and alignment to their, to their needs. Um, just a quick slide about the experiential learning impact of our internship program that we have over the summer. We pound the pavement to starting in, in November to ensure that employers are budgeting in the next uh, fiscal year to ensure that they will take in students uh, and paying them uh, above the minimum wage. We know that we're competing with with other summer jobs that are more traditional for youth. And we wanna make sure that youth are choosing our meaningful experiential learning job opportunities and our meaningful internships, um, but they need meaning and they need paid salaries too. We are also seeing in San Antonio, we have a, a large income disparity. And so there's a lot of poverty among our youth in San Antonio and we wanna make sure that they're well paid. So just last year, we saw about a one point to nine, $1.3 million economic impact on youth employment just on the high school students that we directly placed um, 
And so that's really important to, to us to see that, but it's also the impact in terms of the surveys that we're collecting and information that we're collecting from them in terms of how they are viewing different career pathways that they didn't necessarily consider. So just some quick stats on also employers are really seeing their engagement as part of, of identifying entry level talent. They're seeing it as supporting their next generation of talent. So we try to say you can only tug at their heartstrings for so long. You've got to make it part of their overall uh, talent development strategy and it's got to be meaningful ROI and so we're happy to say that employers see that and again most of these students are coming from our CTE programs because they're seeing them that they also process some of the technical skills that they need to be able to be quickly placed into these internship programs. Just want to wrap up with two different stories and I think that's that hopefully this answers the question that Amber posed to us. You have this young man um, who was highlighted in one of our local newspapers, Jacob, who went into a construction internship as he completed his, his high school year. And prior to that, he really wasn't sure what he was going to do. He had gone through some, some programs, CT programs, but the reality was college was not in his future, at least not immediately. The internship opportunity at George General Contractors really gave him that opportunity to use some of the technical skills that he had learned. And then that internship uh, following his, his um, high school graduation then converted into full, a full-time job offer. He is now meaningful, uh, gainfully employed. He has health insurance, tuition reimbursement program, and it led him on a, on a meaningful pathway. And then we have Stacy, Stacy, who has her sights on going to Columbia University, uh, had interned at our county's procurement office, and um, and she is college bound, and she is now being mentored by one another large company's procurement office. She was our guest uh, uh, speaker, and she was just very impressive. And somebody took notice of her and said, "We want to groom her because we want her to come back to San Antonio and run our procurement uh, department one day." And so. Two very different pathways, one leading to career, another one to college, but that's where we believe that CTU programs can be truly meaningful. So thank you for that. So I'm Kylie Whitaker. I'm with the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, not a real unique organization, so I won't have to explain our organization. Um, but I do want to tell you that my office is the Office of Career and Technical Education and Student Transitions. We just went through a reorg. Uh, that student transitions piece means that we're now in charge of uh, minimum high school graduation requirements in addition to CTE, uh, dual credit, AP, IB programs. Uh, the counselor liaison is actually in my division uh, working with me on a daily basis uh, trying to get school counselors more involved with CTE and with graduation requirements and that graduation requirements are bigger than just uh, the credits that students have to earn, but trying to match those to what students actually want to do after school. And so uh, we're not a traditional CTE office uh, because we've merged so much with um, all of high school requirements. Um, in addition to the fact that we are working very closely with middle school counselors to uh, work on the individual uh, learning plan for students, uh, that's also in my division, and um, career exploration which is in our division as well. And so um, kind of comprehensive uh, look at the work that we do in that office and how they all merge together. So, um, but, but to go directly to the question that you ask, you know, Kentucky really views CTE as that stepping stone to the next thing that students are going to do after high school and after school. And so our big focus is really designing career pathways uh, with a secondary to post-secondary component uh, that has multiple on and off ramps uh, with different jobs requiring different amounts of education that are then going to pay different salaries with students and really educating students on what those possibilities are all along the way, uh, trying to meet students at their really their point of need. Um, not every student has the same goals in life. Not every student's going to the same amount of education in life, and we're trying to show them through these pathways how they can meet their goals regardless of how far they want to go along that uh, course. In order for that to happen, though, we have to build those strong ILP programs at the middle school level, even as far down as the elementary school level, and do that career exploration component so that when students do get to high school, they've experimented some, they figured out what their strengths and weaknesses are, and what really aligns to um, what they're trying to do with their life. Um, 
Now, later on in the presentation, I'll, I'll try and, or the panel discussion, I'll talk more about uh, the data side of this and what, uh, what our data shows us is really uh, strong factors in um, preparing students for post high school outcomes. Um, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kate Kramer, the Deputy Executive Director at Advanced CTE. We are a national nonprofit based in the D.C. area that represents state career technical education directors and other state-level leaders who oversee career tech across the country. Our members are in all 50 states, D.C., and the U.S. territories, and represent K-12, post-secondary, um, and workforce development because CT is all of those things. Um, so we are really a policy advocacy organization that represents our interest here, but also um, answer a lot of questions about what is the purpose of CTE. Um, and we've, we take a very broad view of what CTE is. Our definition is that it's an educational pathway that is preparing the students for the career of their choice. So that is intentionally broad um, because it is all of those things. It isn't just one thing. And so when I think about this question, is, is CT having an identity crisis? No, I think it's it's... It's, ev it's been evolving for years, for decades. Um, it's probably important to know that the career clusters have, only, have been around for less than 20 years. Um, they are a relatively new change to the system that historically was just for some kids, and we know which kids, kids who were placed in those programs, who maybe had the opportunity to get prepared for a job that they stayed in that job for the rest of their lives and were able to be successful, but the economy changed, the demands of our education system changed, our perspectives on equity and supporting all learners have changed and evolved, and so CT is responding to that. So it's a little messy, it is a lot of things. Um, it continues to con grow in terms of the students it serves, the industries that it aligns to, but I think we've made a tremendous progress. We'll keep talking about that. Um, but keep in mind that CT starts in some states in elementary school, increasingly in middle school, includes high school, and goes into post-secondary and beyond. So depending on where students are engaging with that system, they need different things from it. And so it does need to actually serve a lot of different students in a lot of different ways. So in middle school, it is about exploration. It should be about giving all students exposure to the career opportunities in their communities and not just in their tiny town, but in their region and in their state to really open up all those opportunities. In high school, there should be, every student should have access to high quality CTE. Any courses that are offered should be part of a sequence that is intentional, that builds, that starts broad and gets more occupationally specific over time. And I know I'm sure we'll dig back into that. Um, we've got some work to do to build those pathways, to make sure they're quality, to make sure we're attending both to access and to the student supports that are needed. Um, and then when you move, it should be moving into post-secondary because when we look at where the good jobs are, by and large, they are not available without something beyond high school. And so the CT system has shifted to be responsive, looking at they need to build pathways into post-secondary. They need to offer industry credentials that are of value, um, not just easy to get, um, but are the ones that are really demanded. Again, we have more work to do. We can unpack that. Um, Microsoft Office is a good conversation to have. Um, so there's a lot of what has been, what needs to be. I will say states have made a lot of progress in the past decade. They're continuing to make a lot of progress. There's a lot of hard and honest conversations happening. We are not there, but I, I do think it's important to, to acknowledge how far we've come, but also keep in mind how far we have to go. So I'll pause there. Hi, I'm uh, Sandra Clement, and I'm the principal at 4-H Moody High School in Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, we run about close to 1,700 students at, at Moody, and we're uh, an inner city school on the west side of Corpus Christi, we run about 90% economically disadvantaged kids who live in poverty. So for us, our CTE programs target helping our kids get out of poverty. Uh, sinking their teeth into something that's going to be valuable to them. There are many of them are first in their family to ever graduate from high school. So there's no one at home to say, this is the career you should take, or this is the pathway you should take. And, and Katie was uh, very clear about something, and that's middle school should be exploration. What, what we have at least targeted on at Moody High School is that it, at Moody, you're on a coherent course sequence. You're on a pathway. You're on a four-year pathway to some to some pathway of study in CTE. 76% of our students are on a CTE pathway, 76%, because we offer different academies. We have six academies on campus. We have a health science academy, we have a STEM academy, we have a law enforcement academy, we have a culinary arts academy, we have a, uh, our newest Moody informational uh, technology, audio video 
uh, Academy and we have a teacher prep Academy. How did those academies come into play? Some of them have been there for a long time before I got there uh, to some degree and, and some stronger than others. One thing that we started doing years ago um, was that we started looking at our in-demand occupations uh, forecast that's issued out every year by our workforce commission and we look at what's available out there because when you're looking at what's the demand in need out there what's the best uh, wage earning out there I know that there's going to be industries out there I'm going to be able to tap into so that our students will be able to have that experiential learning so that we can get them the certifications and the industry credentials that they need so that they have a better ability an edge of in front of them to be able to make it easier for them to transition into the workforce or transition into post-secondary studies or the military. Whatever pathway they choose, we want them to be able to have the ability to do that, to get a pathway, to sink themselves into, that they belong to something, that they identify with something. We were talking about whether CTE is having an identity crisis, and, and I agree with Kate, it's, it's not sitting on a campus where I've had thousands of conversations with high school students over the years. And, and I can tell you, oh, this is going to pay a lot. For them, it's also this generation. It's about passion. It's not only what, what am I going to earn, but how am I going to love the job that I'm going to do and how am I going to make a difference in it? So there's a, there's a, a qualitative influence there for our students that this generation, it's, we'd like to think, oh, I'm going to go to the highest paid wage earning. Mm, I'm going to go to where I know that I'm going to be happy, that piece of it. Well, then I want you going somewhere. And so for us at Moody High School, that's our key as we look, and we've adjusted. We've had to drop some of our, our career academies that just were not conducive to the labor market. It, it, as, as was stated in your study, which I think was phenomenal, by the way, your data, I'm going to look at it further. Um, but looking at that, also where would that take them? Well, where would that not take them? And we've killed them. And then we've started new ones. In, in the areas that we knew there was a big demand, they would get more scholarships for, or more interns, more rotations for. We were very closely with our business partners in the community because we're building their workforce. They're invested in our advisory boards because of that. But I've got to tell you, on a campus, at a high school campus, CTE is a very purposeful and strategic program. If it's not, then it's an elective. And CTE should not be an elective. It, at high school level, it needs to be a pathway towards some type of career plan. And we'll talk more about that, but I appreciate being here. Thank you. So I'm going to try to direct a few questions to, to specific panelists here. Um, Kylie, I'm going to start with you. So I'm hearing you guys loud and clear about strategic, purposeful. Um, so my, my core question is how much CTE do kids need? Okay, for you, um, but but also just trying to clarify for some of us who maybe don't entirely understand what a pathway is. Okay, so we hear a lot like, well, we want all kids to have college prep courses, and I'm just trying to figure out in high school how you do all the college prep stuff and the CTE pathway stuff, and whether there's some core courses that everybody gets, and there's some that the pathway takes you off in this different direction. So I guess just talk to us a little bit more about how much CTE is enough and how you fit it all in. Sure. So let me start first with uh, how we define a career pathway in Kentucky. It's really a sequence of courses that's designed for one specific career area, uh, whether that's nursing, uh, pharmacy, phlebotomy, welding, construction, or not construction, that's broader, uh, carpentry or electricity. Um, but, but basically it's, it's a non-duplicative sequence of classes with both an, both an academic and a CTE component uh, that's from secondary all the way through post-secondary based on that industry career area. So with uh, registered nursing, the pathway is going to be designed from high school all the way through that bachelor's degree. With electrical, uh, most of our pathways are going to be designed with uh, high school through the associate's degree program or high school through an apprenticeship program. And so. Um, we, we found that uh, NCES's SIP codes list was not specific enough, and so we actually Kentuckyized the SIP codes to get to our career pathways, and so we're 
NCES is zip codes are six digits long, Kentucky's are eight digits long to, to make those more focused pathways. And so um, just a little nuance from the study that you did, uh, we, we had to get a lot more specific in order to get to the pathways in, in the way we define pathways. But there is both that academic and that CTE component to it, uh, which speaks to um, kind of that college focus and career focus both. And so it's really a college focus based on what they need for that specific career. And so if it's uh, nursing with that bachelor's degree in mind, there's certain classes that students are going to have to take if they want to get to that bachelor's degree. And so designing those pathways specifically with those courses in mind on both the general ed, gen ed and the CTE side to get to that. And so um, I can probably go into that more later, but going back to the first question that you asked about how much CTE is really needed, um, so it varies depending on what your uh, idea of success is. And so I'll give you the first step in success. If we can help a student figure out what they definitely don't want to do when they get to post-secondary and they don't waste money on it while they're in high school, then that's success to us. That's not our ultimate goal, but if we can get there and save students student debt, college loan debt, which is a huge crisis now, um, that, that is a form of success. If we can get students to a concentrator status, which right now we define as three credits, three technical credits in that pathway, um, that, that success in the fact that they, it, that along with an industry recognized credential means higher employment and higher wages after high school based on our data. But ultimately, uh, the ultimate goal of CTE and how much I think is really needed is completion of one of those pathways, which uh, we define as four credits, four technical credits in one particular career area. And our data shows that students who do complete pathways are more likely to earn a degree after high school, they're more likely to be employed after high school, and they're more likely to earn higher wages after high school. Um, and it's not particularly, it doesn't necessarily have to be that they're going directly from the high school program into a related job or a related post-secondary program, but by going through that entire sequence of classes, by going through that entire pathway, students learn something that makes a difference in their post high school outcomes for them. And so ultimate goal, completion of a pathway. If we can't get to completion of a pathway, if we can get them to concentrator plus an industry recognized credential that has value, Kate, um, that, that is going to be successful. Um, but if we can at least save students some money um, after high school, that, that's a form of success for us. So just so I'm clear, so the ideal is you come in at maybe ninth grade, because in middle school you've spent your I time exploring, it. right? You've, yeah. you've been the explorer in middle school. Time to get a ninth grade, you're like ready to say, hmm, I think I like this pathway, maybe I want to be a nurse. And then what you're saying is at the high school level, you're, you're setting them up and saying, hey, this is what you need to do after high, high school. It's like you're, you're actually doing some research for them and saying this is what you need to be doing at the community college or the four-year level, or you know, if this is, you know, if you need an industry certificate, this is what it takes. So you're doing all that legwork for them to give them that information. And then what if they aren't ready at ninth or grade to do a pathway? Are they just, uh, I guess I'm just trying to figure out like when is the point where you kind of force their hand, right, to say this is kind of what I'm interested in doing? So a couple of things there. Um, if we have school systems in Kentucky where at the middle school level, you really don't know what high school you're going to. Um, there's, there's a lot of student choice. And so designing specific middle school programs that are going to lead directly into those high school programs is sometimes not possible. And so many of our high schools do offer a ninth grade career exploration component. Um, I, I strongly believe in middle school career exploration and with beginning a pathway in ninth grade. Where that's not possible, I do think that you have to allow some career exploration to happen or else what you're gonna find is that students do hop from one intro level class to another intro level class to another intro level class, trying to figure out what it is that they do like to do. And so building those strong middle school programs and where not possible that strong ninth grade program to allow a student to then go into a pathway. Um, I don't like the idea of ever forcing a student in at any certain time. And so we do have students who begin pathways um, in 11th and 12th grade um, before they've kind of figured out where they want to go. Um, like I said before, that's not our goal, but there is a form of success with that if they can figure that out by 11th or 12th grade. Uh, back to the, some of the legwork we're doing. So Kentucky is really focused on designing 9 through 14, 9 through 16, and 9 through uh, 
uh, a doctorate in some programs area in some areas of that um, biomedical sciences being one of those uh, nine through apprenticeship model programs where we're creating models that the state can use. So we're doing some of that legwork. We're sitting down with employers and then we're sitting down with our post-secondary partners and truly designing those seamless pathways um, from, from high school all the way through whatever ultimate goal it is for that particular career. Um, but they're models. And so we can't do that for every single school in the state, but our models can then be taken at a local level and they can sit down with their own post-secondary partners and say, okay, this is what the model is. Where do we need to switch it in order for that to happen? But, but a lot of that legwork is happening at the state level and needs to happen at the state level to create those models for schools to understand. And then our state was, um, I, don't, I don't know if we were forward thinking enough or what, but as part of this work where we actually redesigned our minimum high school graduation requirements to allow more freedom um, in choice where uh, the math, the English, the science courses are designed to be personalized based on what the student's goals are. And so if it's a, a nursing path, then one of those math classes would be medical math as opposed to the traditional uh, algebra one geometry, algebra two pre-calculus sequence of math classes. And so um, that work does have to happen in order to design a true pathway for students. Can, can I jump in on yes, one thing? You also asked about how can you fit in the schedule both the CT and the kind of college prep, and that's an issue, right? I mean, scheduling is definitely an issue, but I think the states and communities that are taking CT really seriously and focusing on quality, like Kentucky, like Delaware, like Ohio, like many others, are embedding early post-secondary opportunities in their CT programs and programs of study. So every single Tennessee program of study has an EARL, has a either dual enrollment, AP, IB embedded in that program of study, signaling to students that how you take, they now have closed the gap between CT and non-CT students earning early post-secondary credits. Um, Delaware, they do not approve a program of study but does not have a dual enrollment component to it that is in that technical sequence of courses. So that, that is signaling Yes, you probably need post-secondary education. We are going to be very intentional that these pathways are, are being built so that they can give you that, that smooth transition over. So it may, may be the AP and courses where that makes sense. Um, it may be a dual enrollment where that makes more sense. So I think that is where the field is going. Um, again, responsive to where the economy is demanding um, the skills and the degrees and the certifications. So. Do you mind if I follow up one more time on that one? Because the models that we're creating, there's every model is actually three models, uh, with with one model being um, starting dual credit college classes at the ninth grade level, another model is starting dual credit classes at the eleventh grade level, and then the third model is all high school classes, but showing how those high school classes feed into that post secondary component, and so. Um, we're doing that specifically because not every student's ready to take dual credit at ninth grade. Not every student's ready to even take dual credit at 11th grade in these cases. And we want to create models that can be used regardless of where that student is in their path and with their uh, goals in life. May I jump in a little bit? I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, it, and just to kind of dig deeper from the high school end, when we look at our kids coming in for ninth to 12th grade, you're right, the middle school is the exploration piece. That would be the best opportunity. The best model would be that they figure it out then. And not to say, I've had, I had a valedictorian that came in to study medicine because he wanted to be a physician. Extremely smart. Went through all his four years, took principles of health science, medical terminology, dual credit. Went into rotations his junior year and then practiced to come his senior year because our four-year study, if you look at, at, we were talking about what courses, all of them in ninth grade are usually a principles, principles of law enforcement, principles of culinary, principles of uh, teaching and learning, and then they build on from there. We have introduction to engineering that then leads into principles of engineering that then leads into educational, I mean, engineering design and development. So there's a sequence of courses that continue with rigor and all of them include either pre-AP, pre-advanced courses, dual credit or dual enrollment courses. But that being said, when we look at that, and you were talking about that, we, we look at that one, that one valedictorian that I had. I remember his valedictorian speech. I am glad that I learned that I came to this four-year program. I'm glad because it taught me that I did not want to be a doctor. It taught me that with all of my math courses that I had to take that were advanced for this program, I'm a, I want to be an accountant. I fell in love with math. I fell in love with that type of, and for us is the structure. The structure of getting this youth before they get to college or to the military or to the workforce directly, 
they've got some type of structured plan. Do they not, they're teenagers. If I hear one more one of them say, I'm in love, I'm just going to throw up. <laughs> and so, and I tell them that because they, they have to be rerouted. The, the key pieces are counselors and their relationships with their teachers and with their principal is to ensure that they stay on track. No, you're not allowed out. You made this choice and it doesn't mean you're going to be a nurse or you're going to be an engineer or you're going to be a jailer. No, you're graduating with your jailer certificate um, or an EMT. It means I've learned that what I can, I have gained so much from a four year pathway course of study that's going to take me on to whatever it is that I'm going to do, whether it, it, it in any capacity, that's what we're building. We're not building a random traditional high school that's not conducive to kids. It's not conducive to our workforce. And we've got to prepare them to be successful out there. I don't want them to only be successful at Moody. I need them to be successful when they leave. And so that, that's what kind of drives our CTE program. All right, I'll play devil's advocate again. This all sounds great, um, but how in the world can every district, much less every high school, do all of this well, right? I mean, I'm just trying to think, are there certain clusters or pathways that high school is particularly well suited for? And maybe some of these other clusters, Cameron showed us the, all these little short names for the, all the clusters, there are a lot of them. There. Um, and, and, and you talk to district superintendents and, and principals of high schools, they're like, we just can't do all of this, right? So I guess, Romani, let me start with you and talk to us a little bit about whether you think there are certain industries or careers that high school CT is particularly well suited to address. Well, I would hope that those in the target demand industries for, for us in our community and, and other communities as well, you know, something that we hear and I love Sandra's passion and those of other educators is we really want to graduate students to be successful beyond our high school. We want them to have to be self-sufficient. We want them to have access to opportunity and economic and social mobility. So I think those industries that offer that should be those that are best suited for CTE programs and in, in, in my humble opinion. Uh, but I also know that in many cases, there's some real barriers and challenges that school districts and our um, some of our lower income school districts have, and that is in, in the teaching profession. Sometimes they just can't afford to hire uh, an educator who already has the experience to really create an, a robust IT computer science CTE program. Um, we're having to compete against the private sector who can afford to pay them much more. And so I think uh, a real barrier in some of our um, in some of our poor school districts is just being able to just compete to be able to hire that talent or to train the talent as well. And that's something that we often hear from, from industry as well is they just don't see some of our educators having the level of industry knowledge, especially in IT and in manufacturing that is changing all the time to be able to teach what they need today, but they're also stepping up and saying, how can we be helpful? And I think that's, that's really important. I think we're often talking about uh, a workforce that's going to be uh, reskilled and upskilled. And I don't think that we often talk about it enough in the context of educators. What are we doing? And maybe from a national perspective is how can we look at professional development also for educators so that if we're asking them to teach in these high demand, high wage industries, then we also have to equip them with the skills and knowledge because things have changed a lot since many of them have come into the teaching profession. They, it's a vocation, I believe, and they're passionate about it, but we also have to give them the skills and knowledge to be able to teach it effectively. Anybody else want to take that one up? Any, any of these clusters that we think, eh, that's really not CTE? I'll, I'll take that up. At the, at the high school level, you're right. There are certain uh, clusters that are they will be good at any high school. You can implement it anywhere. Health, health is for one of them. You know, everywhere you go, you're going to need a hospital. There's always access to the ability to partner with your local hospitals to provide students. It's easy to build a program where you have CNAs, EMTs, phlebotomies, EKG technicians, all of that within a program. That's easy. When we look at our engineering program, which is extremely successful and one of the most popular, we have a petrochemical industry. Well, our kids can't do internships or rotations in the petrochemical industry because they can't 
for their own rules for safety can't allow them in there. So we have to get creative with other ways for them to, to be involved in, in water sampling. We research and be mentored by their employees. They're very, they're very connected with us. So we find other ways so that our kids are exposed and introduced to that. Plus we have te teacher externships that go there. But one, one key piece I think that's important is that you do look at your local labor market, not only locally, regionally, statewide. You have to look at that. What, what is it that, that we need? What's the industry that's going to be most conducive to the program that, and the experiential learning that we're going to provide? Uh, what type of advisory council members are going to support this? Because that's they care about their workforce. They're building their workforce. So how do we tap into that? Uh, we've got local prisons. Well, m my kids that are in law enforcement and, and want to study law can't go into the prison. So we look within our own district. We're a large district with 38,000 students. We've got our own police department within our district. So our students do their internships and their uh, work based learning through our, our, our district police department, our police force. And they're extremely active. They cover games. They monitor hallways. Our kids respect them. It, it, I, I have such, such an impressive view of them. Uh, but there's a whole lot of that that you have to look at. You're right. It's not a one size fits all. It can't be. You have to look at your region because that's what CTE, to me, is about. That's the way that we do it on our campus to ensure that we're, bu we're truly building for the workforce that's ahead for, for the people that are going to take care of us in so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, we obviously agree as the manager of the career cluster framework, we obviously support all 16 career clusters. Um, and I think it, it, it comes back to what's the demand of your economy and of your employers and where community opportunities are. I mean, we have programs of petrochemical. That is not going to be relevant in 90%, I don't know, percent, whatever percent of communities across the country. Mm -hmm. We um, recognize a colonology program from New, New Jersey because they have a ton of food scientist jobs. And so they created a new program that blends agriculture and hospitality because they had interest from their employers that let's build this together. That's wonderful. That's what CT should be doing and being responsive. I think the other side of that is are you offering too many programs right, in certain communities? And so looking at the saturation, right? If you're in a community, how many programs is enough? So are you overcompensating in some areas and under attending to other clusters? And so I think that's a, that's a more important conversation for states and regions to have about are we hitting all of our sectors? Do we have enough spots for students? Are we going a little too much on, well, students like this, and we've got the teachers, so let's just offer more of these, but we don't have the economic need kind of on that. So I think that's the balancing act um, between kind of what, what you can offer and what you should be offering. So going along with that, um, one thing that Kentucky's focused on with our new skills for youth grant, thank you, JP, Morgan Chase, just <laughs> FY. Uh, sorry, I had to throw that in, guys, um, is, is getting different districts to work together um, to provide these opportunities. Like you said, not everyone can do everything. But if you get districts to partner together, realize that you're all doing the same thing, mm -hmm. and you can divide that up so that you can do new things with the resources. So doing that asset mapping and that gap analysis to see what are the local needs, what are we doing, what are we not hitting, what, what are we oversaturating right now, um, and then partnering together to provide those opportunities to students is one of the major goals of our New Skills for Youth initiative. And it's, it's crucial, especially in some of our rural and smaller communities, um, because they're not going to be able to offer those opportunities, not a broad base of opportunities with small school systems. And, and if I could just touch on a little bit more of that, the 16 clusters, there's no way. We do six, and we do them well. And, and for those six that we hit, we, we move out some sometimes when we review our, our local in-demand occupations, and we bring in others where it's shown a huge interest. One thing that I, that I, I caution to state or advocate to state leaders is that, um, you know, if I, if I have a welding program, my kids are going to graduate uh, with a certification in welding and go out and, and earn $35, $40 an hour right out of high school then I can't take your traditional teacher who graduates from, from college with a four-year degree to teach welding. Mm -hmm. I need a welder who's been out in the workforce for 20 years and now retiring from that to come in and teach welding. And, and that requires states, state leaders, to say, okay, you're allowed to, these are allowed to be certified to teach and can receive an alternative certification. I think that's critical to CTE programs is that they work closely with state leaders to state, come on. 
let us take people from the workforce that have substantial uh, experience and can bring that in to the classroom. They're not going to get that practical experience from anybody else. Our health science teachers at, at freshman and sophomore level teaching medical term and principles of health science were RNs and LVNs. That's, that's where I, I, I stole them from, actually, from their <laughs> applications for school nurses. I went into that area and, and kind of called them on the phone and said, hey, like separate from that, then I've got the call. Uh, our, our local Del Mar College sends in. I've got three uh, professors that come and teach the junior and senior level courses on our campus. And then our EMT students are, are bus there. So we, we make it work. Does every, can I tell you that every high school knows how to do it or that every district does? No, sadly, no. And I, and I think someday when I retire, that's going to be my goal is to go out there and help people do what we do because it, it's not rocket science. It can be done. You just, you just have to be invested. Yeah, we, we absolutely do that in Kentucky. I mean, occupation-based teacher certification, they're actually in most of our areas, the only people that are allowed to teach the classes are the people Perfect. directly from industry. I mean, we actually have an entire program. It's a two-year program headed up by Jody Adams. Um, who who does that teacher training for those people coming in from industry, how to actually teach, not just how to do it. They have the skills to do it. It's how to teach students. Um, but we have an entire program for that. Um, and we just changed all of our regs so that we could actually uh, battle private industry in terms of how much we can pay teachers to come in and, and teach in the classroom. Uh, to make us a lot more competitive, we're still not competitive with private industry, but a lot more competitive, and so it's um, we have a lot more teachers willing to come in and teach now um, directly from industry. And uh, I can't tell you how valuable that is. You're exactly right there. We're being very intentional in, in San Antonio too. Just looking at uh, to your point about overly saturated in some CTE courses, but yet lacking in others. So um, I think with our engagement at the K-12 level, we were able to really come in and start looking at the CTE landscape across, like I said, over 15 school districts in San Antonio. So what's missing? What can be in alignment? And I think there was uh, overall willingness from a lot of our key school districts to make a shift, a shift in programmatic redesign and even dropping some of those, um, some of those CT programs that they just didn't feel were going to put, especially in our in our lower socioeconomic areas of San Antonio that would put their young men, and I would say women, a lot of the young ladies who are in CTE programs are not necessarily in those earning those high credential CTE uh, certificates. And that's really important because then we're just creating a generation of poverty. And so, um, but we had to really be, be helpful and thoughtful also as to how industry would engage. And so we have some of our um, large employers, again, big shout out to, to Toyota and HEB and others, but they also said, look, we have a pretty good system of knowing what our retirees are looking like and who's who's going to re retire here soon. And so I think to Sandra's point earlier, it's about some school districts getting really creative about how to engage industry. And maybe if they can't compete because of salaries, maybe it is a retiree who may want and have a, a passion for, for giving back and and can can serve as um, serve back in, in the classroom. And so we're just being very intentional about how can we start getting the word out sooner and to start filling that also that skills gap that's in the teaching profession you guys are doing so good just talking with each other and not making me do all the work with moderating can i can i chime in <laughs> jump in i've got I actually got a question i'll chime in and I'll, I'll let this one go then i would just say uh, it's it's really great to be on this panel and listen to everyone here answer their question in a way that i also agree with I, if there's going to be a a CTE program in high school, um, should there be, should there not be? Obviously, it should be informed by the labor market in the, the really proximal area, but then also regional area. I totally concur with that 100%. The truth is, though, is that we have exemplars on this panel, which is why they're here, right? Um, and that I don't know if, we, if it's possible to quantify just how extensive this sort of approach to developing strong CT programs is. Um, I would just point out to people in the room that are curious, is this the modus operandi for CTE? Is this CTE now? Um, the new Perkins legislation actually spe specifically spells out the need to align programs of study um, with labor market data. And my reading of the legislation is, um, informs me that that's the first time that that's actually spelled out. I actually read four and then five coming in here. And I couldn't find any reference to labor market data in four. 
and then in five it's it's spelled out i think in like 134 c or something like that of the legislation so i think what we have here on the panels are um you know top-notch exemplars in the field that you know best that know best practices better than anybody um and it's encouraging to see that that legislation is is going to hopefully reinforce that and make it an integral component moving forward I mean, I will say under Perkins 4, there was a focus on high skill, high wage, high demand, and then they decided to rename it in demand. Um, but I, I will agree that Perkins 5 is much more intentional and not just the state level, but I think one of the most significant changes of, in the law that a lot of what we're talking about is what should happen is through a comprehensive local needs assessment. So anybody who, any yeah. district, post-secondary institution, area technical center that receives CT money as a pa yeah. pass-through from the state has to go through a really robust needs assessment process where they're looking at their performance data, disaggregated, they're yeah. looking at their progress implementing programs and program of study with a focus on how they're aligning to labor market data, kind of state or regional, and there's kind of some good language in there around allowing for some local flexibility. So I'm sure we'll get back and talk about the data and the challenges with the data, but having some opportunities for that, as well as looking at how they're working to close equity gaps, how they're supporting, or how, how their current kind of faculty and staff, how they're working with them, how they're supported, what that pipeline looks like, what the professional development needs are for not just teachers, but also counselors and all the, the professionals. Mm -hmm. And essentially they're shifting, that needs that has to happen, and then that becomes the basis of their application. So they're saying, here's what we found, here's what's working, here's what's not working, and here's how we want to invest our resources to make sure that we are making these improvements and being responsive. So that is not how it is designed now. Um, it's a very big challenge that states are really thinking through how to make sure they're providing that right guidance and supports. Um, to your point, not everyone's going to you know, nail it the first time out, but I think it's a real signal change and a real different way about doing business for, for many. So we're pretty excited about that. I agree. And this local needs assessment is a great opportunity for states to get um, school districts to look at labor market information and see if they really are aligning their programs with the needs of both the local and the state um, labor market data. Um, and states that want this to happen, this is your opportunity to do this. This requirement in Perkins 5 to have this local needs assessment and to make them do that asset mapping piece. And so I strongly recommend that states look at that and how they can strengthen whatever program that they're planning to do. Um, oh, and the other requirement to, just to, for Romani is that it does involve quite a bit of stakeholder engagement. So kind of what that looks like, it could be on the front end, it could be on the back end to validate it, it could be throughout the whole process in terms of who are your partners from business and industry, from students, from parents, workforce development, economic development, it's a very, very long list um, of who are those other stakeholders in the CT system who should be part of those conversations, which I think is really important to have, right, your intermediaries, your workforce development reinforcing um, and asking those tough questions. So um, I'll start with Cameron on this one because I know that your research spoke to some of the evidence around tracking or lack thereof. Um, you know, we, we all know in the room we're still, there's still a stigma around CTEs, it's still old Votech, are we really in this new era of, of pathways and all this great stuff we're hearing about? Um, so I guess talk to me a little bit about what your research showed about tracking, maybe what even other research has shown around that point, and obviously the panel can, can jump in in terms of what you're seeing in, in your own experience. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to uh, jumpstart the conversation. I'm not the, the only voice with opinions or um, some knowledge on the subject, but in my own personal research, I don't find uh, systematic, clear, um, you know, as day evidence of tracking along racial and uh, ethnic lines. I think that most of us associate with traditional forms of vota uh, vocational education. And I think that for a lot of folks, uh, the lack of clear tracking by race and ethnicity um, is perhaps sufficient for them to say um, as an axiomatic statement that there is no longer any stratification um, or tracking. And uh, I, I agree and I also disagree because I do see pretty clear evidence of tracking by gender um, into um, you know, STEM, non-STEM fields. Um, remunerative to less remunerative field. So I think um, I, I, that's kind of, uh, I, I don't think it's a con con contentious statement to say that there are disparities in CT participation by, by gender. I think Romanita has picked up on that um, in her earlier comments. And it sounds like she's doing tremendous work um, around like, encouraging females into, into you know, the pro program at Toyota. Um, 
I, there's other research beyond my own, obviously. Um, I'd call attention to Matt Gianni's work, who has access to the, the, the cumulative corpus of, of Texas state data. And he found limited evidence of tracking as well. Previous reports by Sean Doherty, um, one of which Fordham released, also found less evidence of, of tracking by, by race and ethnicity. So that's a good news uh, story, right? And I think it um, goes hand in hand with the uh, over time longitudinal change of um, what we know now today is CTE from what it once was, which was vocational education. In many respects, is CTE having an identity crisis? The question itself um, it is a good one. Um, the panel here seems to, you know, in some respects, feel like the verdict is clear on that. No, we know what it is. <laughs> but I still think that there's a the identity crisis is with the public's perception of CTE, Absolutely. not with the practitioners of CTE who view it as relevant and rigorous and know it to be that. Um, but I think there is still a lingering perception of CTE of being that mechanism, uh, that suboptimal tracking mm -hmm. mechanism. Um, and so, and yeah, that's what I've observed about, about tracking. I, I do see it, but I also don't see it. Um, and with that said, most of my research and the research I'm familiar with um, use the, um, uses national data, so that's quite aggregate, um, or state-level data. So there is, of course, I'm sure, some heterogeneity going on at the district level, so um, don't want to um, paint over that with a broad brush. And so one of the complaints that we got in our own department um, when we started rolling out these pathways and this work that we're doing in CTE is that um, we're forcing students to choose their lifelong career at the age of 13 or 14 years of age. Um, and, and it's a legitimate kind of um, uh, response to what we're trying to do. The, the fact of the matter is, is the models that we're creating are designed around a specific career area. But um, with our post-secondary partners, what we're trying to show is that the classes that are, they're taking can lead to lots of different degrees. And so it's not one particular degree. There's multiple choice still after that. It's just that we want them to start to focus on what they want to do after school, at least in the broader sense, um, and then have those different paths that they can take during post-secondary. Um, one of the IT pathways that we designed um, is a 9 through 16 pathway, but it actually leads to nine different degree programs. And so it's not one degree program all the way through. It's lots of choice for students. And so trying to get past that, that tracking um, of students and making, forcing them to stay on this one specific path all the way through. Um, so we are trying to, uh, to respond to, to that criticism um, on the tracking piece. But... Um, but we still do want students to try to figure out what they want to do while in high school. Um, results speak for themselves there. Yeah, I mean, so I will agree on the stigma. I mean, it's just, yeah. it just, just never ends. So there's that. I, back on the issue of tracking, I think it's really dangerous to suggest that there is not tracking anymore because that means we've solved the problem and it's done. And I, I, the data is inconclusive. I mean, you, you admit it, your data is not statistically significant. So it might be noise. We, I, I don't think we can use that to say, like, this is not tracking. Also because we're not looking at the quality. And we know, looking at just school system in America, K-12, there are inequities. Looking at the segregation that is happening and resegregation, which CT was used for that purpose, we know those, that that legacy is still there. I think conversations are happening. We haven't had the data to be able to dive in. That is changing. More states are diving into the data to look at who is being served, what's the outcome data. I think there is some tracking some tracking within and across clusters, kind of understanding in the new research from AAI, I think raises some really important questions about who's in the newer pathways in the health science and the engineering and who's in the more traditional pathways and who's being counseled in those and what's being available in certain communities. Suburban CT often can look very different than urban CT and rural CT. So I don't have the answers. The research is not clear, but I do not think we can take that question off the table. And, the, and, and we have to operate from an assumption that we are underserving some students and design a system that is intentionally supporting them, not just providing access, but providing the supports for success. So that is my answer on tracking. And I agree just with to you be on clear, that. I would, I would agree with that. Okay. By the way, I, just, I wanted to be clear, uh, clear that I didn't necessarily agree with the axiomatic statement that there is no tracking. Um, I, I, what I was trying to communicate was that people that see the lack of systematic evidence as an opportunity to declare mm -hmm. 
And, and I don't necessarily agree with that. So just to be clear, that's not my particular well, position. I think that there are challenges. I mean, there has been such an increase in CT from an elective standpoint that when you look at you know graduates, you have the vast majority of high school graduates taking some CTE, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you shift to who's getting the intentional kind of treatment of taking the sequence of courses, but there's still a lot of work in terms of the noise kind of with, you know, between and across clusters, between and across programs, between and across schools, that I think merits a lot more research to really understand what is happening and what is not happening. Totally agree. I think, yes, we, we see a lot of women in our health science program, so we try to target our boys. We see a lot of boys in our STEM program, so we try to target our girls in order to gauge and bring in that interest from them. But, but we do know one thing is that um, uh, the counselor, the counselor who sits and meets with those students and actually has the influence to create their trajectory. And so one thing that we had discovered, at least in the past, and what I've read in, 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 in practical applications with other people, was that counselors were predetermining what, where that student should be based on how they came in eighth grade, based on where they were at in ninth grade. And, and that was such a disservice to kids. It's such a disservice to kids. And it's not the counselor's fault, per se, in terms of where they had been at. Counselors need to be well-informed. They need to be receive the right, the right information, the right professional development. They need to be supported by the right schools, by the right CTE directors, by the right uh, superintendents. I'm very, I'm very lucky. I can't speak for other schools, but I know. I hear you. There are other schools that aren't. It hurts my heart when I go visit those schools and go, it hurts it for those kids because they, there's so much that can be done. And, and we have a very progressive superintendent and a very progressive CT uh, specialist that really works hard with all of our schools in order to provide those opportunities. Is it perfect? Do we constantly try to strengthen it? Yes. But one area that I believe, like Kate said, yes, the, the data is just not there to support that we're not tracking. We're tracking and we're trying to move as many students that we can that are non-traditional into those roles. And we're finding that we're, we're pushing that we're pushing that envelope. It, it's just not happening overnight. I think some of it is happening also just based on poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and so our school districts that are serving high poverty areas um, may also have less rigorous, less uh, mm -hmm. academically challenging or opportunities to offer more, more options in these high demand, high wage CTE pathways. So it may not be intentional necessarily, but but inevitably they are serving our students of color and they are serving um, really students who, who would benefit more, um, as Kate mentioned earlier, suburban CT programs look very differently. And we, we see it there in San Antonio with 15 different school districts. Um, there's work yet to be done. We're, we're getting in the middle of the weeds and trying to inform and to help those school districts that want to significantly uh, improve and reform their CTE programs, but there's also um, just the politics of trying to shift when you think about uh, teachers who have been teaching a specific CTE courses that are very popular and they're fun with the students, and that's the other piece that we also need to address. And sometimes to do away with a popular CTE program is a challenge, and it's an administrative challenge. We had to ex we experienced that firsthand with one of our school districts where we had the CTE director approach us and he said, look, I need to make some significant changes. I need industry to back me up at the school board meeting that's coming up because I'm going to make some very uh, unpopular changes. And so I think we just also need to, to, to be realistic about the fact that there there's some challenges along along the way. Oh, there's huge challenges when I when I so only because of work and I hope for educators out there listening to please take this to call me come see me I, we get so many visits from schools across the state and across the nation that visit Moody High School to look at our best practices so that they can replicate it at their schools and we do our best to help them and support them I I I do my best as well but the one thing I know that when I got there seven years ago the the campus was in its second year of academically under an unacceptable per, standing from the state and we had 30 35 enrollments in dual credit and there was that thought because because we're a high poverty uh region area there was that thought of well well 
Moody students can't take calculus. Moody students can't take dual class statistics. They can't take college algebra. We're sitting right now at 505 enrollments this year in dual credit with a 98% passing rate. And they're not taught by May teachers on campus. They're taught by college professors at our local college through an online. They do online uh, dual learning. And so you can't. You have to build it with good instruction. You have to build it with good PD. And then you, you, you have to get them there. And it's a culture. But can it be done? Yes, with the right people in the right place places, but you're right. I think that they're not, and it's not because we're doing something special, it's because we believe and because we're strategic, but you can expect from the state down to the CT departments, through the CT campuses, through your superintendents and through your CT directors, down to your principals, and then together with your teachers, it, it's got to be a structure that works. It's got to be a structure that will not accept failure. And and it's 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 I could, sorry, I'm on my soapbox. I live and breathe this every day, and it's hard, and it ages me, but it should. <laughs> but it should. Um, and, and not to resurrect the tracking issue one more time, um, although it sounds like we're still kind of on it. But um, I would say that, um, yeah, obviously we need more research. We need more data analysis, especially disaggregated to local, regional levels. Um, which is why uh, I am encouraged to read in the new per Perkins legislation specific language around disaggregating data reporting. Um, and I know that's you know been a thing for a while, but to see it specifically mentioned repeatedly throughout the legislation, hopefully, will generate more uh, nuanced, uh, informative data around this very, very important issue of tracking. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we'll see some of that data now start coming out from the folks that um, have access to these very, very rich data sets that folks like me don't necessarily have, have access to. Not, not to go farther down this rabbit hole, but <laughs> you know, tracking still does occur. Um, I do a lot of school visits, um, and one of the most discouraging things that I hear when I ask about uh, particular people, roles, positions, and what they do with CTE, one of the first things I hear is, oh, you mean that stuff that's for students not going to college? And that, that is very discouraging, um, and it is a form of tracking that still occurs. Uh, students who are not going in, you know, the, the thought is students are not going to college, so let's put them in CTE. But if they're going to college, let's not put them into CTE. Uh, th that is a mindset that we're still having to overcome. Um, but, but what I would say is that we've not done the kind of job that we need to inform those people about what CTE really yeah. is. And so we, we are trying to step up marketing to try and explain what CTE is, show uh, the gen ed teacher's role in CTE that, you know, you don't just teach math, you're teaching math for a purpose. And so if the student's in uh, an electrical program, what's the math that's going to be relevant for that and showing them their role, the high school counselor, uh, they, they, you know, their college prep programs are not truly preparing them completely to be career advisors to students. And, show, and so providing that professional development to them to help them see their role and how they can uh, advise students on CTE pathways and future jobs and how they connect together. Uh, we've, we've not done enough of that. We've got to do a better job of that. So I don't hold, it's discouraging for me because I feel like they would be on board if we just did a better job of explaining it to them. Um, and so, but the tracking is still occurring um, and we've got to do a better job of um, explaining what CTE really is. Good job, you guys. That was a comprehensive discussion of that. Um, I'm going to jump to a new topic, and I think you're all going to have opinions about this as well. So, uh, and that's industry certi certificate certifications. I feel like there's a growing awareness now that we, whoops, now I'm still on, that we don't want kids to have meaningless pieces of paper, right, in these industry certifications. So, I guess talk to me a little bit about how we're starting to clamp down a little bit, trying to get higher quality. Are we holding the f people that are giving the certifications accountable for giving kids worthless pieces of paper? Um, are the states doing their jobs and sort of like, is it their job to sort of say, here's what we're going to accept? Um, you talked to me a little bit about a Texas policy that is now giving points, accountability points for schools that, that have so many certifications that kids get. So there are all sorts of activity going on, but talk to me a little bit about like how we're going to get better at this. I'll this is, this is a really tough conversation. Um, <laughs> you know, one, a piece of paper could be really meaningful for a very large employer in the local area, but meaningless for everyone else across the state. And so is that, 
is that a worthless piece of paper or is it meaningful for students trying to get jobs with that particular employer? It's, it's incredibly hard. Uh, Kentucky's passed legislation on exactly how we identify which industry recognized credentials count for both Perkins and for state accountability. But um, I've, I've been doing this for years now. Uh, there's not a lot of data to support all of it. We're doing studies now, but a lot of these credentials are new. Very few students have earned them, so showing outcomes based on credentials is extremely hard. Um, but it's, it's a very convoluted one. We have narrowed down our list in Kentucky through the ne new legislation, which does begin with our local uh, workforce investment boards and their employer partners. Um, but even in each of the local areas, let, let's say 10 employers go to talk to the local uh, workforce investment board in that area, Seven of them think that it's great. The other three could care less about that particular credential. And so where do we define uh, credential of value and how do we define that? Um, we have a very uh, robust process, I would say, in Kentucky for how we do this, but it's still not perfect. And it still leaves a lot of question as to whether or not everything on our list carries value with it. Uh, unless you were a high school that uh, focused on getting your kids to get a job after high school with the credentials, and that was something that you focused on, I can tell you those were, were few. Um, our state accountability for any school principal and school district is our big, it's our big carrot. Um, how are we going to look? Uh, are we going to have an A, a B, a C, or a D? Because it doesn't matter what you do all year. It's what happens on that one day of testing or on now on that, uh, on that industry credential. What Texas recently did uh, over the last two years was they created part of our accountability framework. 40% uh, of it is tied to college career and uh, military readiness. And so part of that is if you receive an industry, if, you're, if your students graduate with an industry uh, certified credential that's on their approved list, um, then you get a point on your accountability for that. And that's that is very weighty and it has suddenly just opened everybody's eyes and, and garnered everyone's attention clearly. So everyone's going back backward design and looking at the industry credential and then say, I'm going to build a CTE program around that. Um, and, and that's fine as long as you're doing something in terms of that's going to meet with your, with your labor market. You're clearly, <clears throat> excuse me, not going to follow a credential for like Toyota. They're not in Corpus Christi. I don't have car manufacturing in Corpus Christi, so that's not going to be a viable a credential for us to go with. We're going to go with a credential that we know our kids locally will get hired. Um, and so, it, but now that they've tied it to accountability, going back to that, it, it's become now in the forefront of everyone's uh, uh, viewpoint. And so, from our lens, those industry credentials are big. They're huge. Mm -hmm. And then there's a cost now because when I went to the, um, the state conference, there was a lot of people there talking to our Texas Education Agency, which is our state agency, and saying, you know, these credentials oh, were great. We were looking at them. And, stuff, and now suddenly their prices have gone up. Interestingly enough, because you know what? They made your list. And so, you know, te the, the, you know the advisors from over there were like, well, um, um, there, was, there was no one, you know, that cost that cost money making uh, side of it. So now we're, we're using CTE in order to facilitate our students into still receiving those credentials because no one seems to have the answer to that other than you have to pay it. And so, um, so we're kind of, we're, there's a whole lot of stuff that's coming out of the closet with those things. Yeah, I mean, building on, on that, it, it is a really complicated issue. I think there's a lot of attention. People think it's like the silver bullet. Bottom line, it isn't the silver bullet. Um, I think it's really important that states have probably start more restrictive and, and add versus putting everything on it because we know every employer in the building trade, so yeah, sure, OSHA 10 is really important, but that's a minimum expectation of being hired. That is not a credential of value. That's you sit in a classroom for 10 hours and you don't even take a test. It's super important. You cannot get hired without it, but it also is not something that should be weighted in an accountability system the same way that an AW, an American Welding Society mm -hmm. credential, which requires an extensive more amount of experience and skill aptitude. I think the challenge is trying to force credentials for every single program and every pathway and every cluster, and it doesn't always make sense. Um, and I think being okay that not every pathway can end in a industry-recognized credential. There are post-secondary credentials and certificates. There are 
some states have used AP as a way of saying, or dual enrollment to say this is kind of, this requires additional education training beyond, beyond high school, so that's actually the, the value of saying that you are ready for something next, right, is with that signal. I will say m over 20 states have built industry credentials into their, S their, their federal and state accountability system, so a huge push um, under the last ESSA, kind of up from about 10, give, give or take, to over 20. So definitely an area. Um, it, kind of usually in a kitchen sink approach to say if a student does one of these eight things, including earning issue credential, they will kind of be deemed college or ready and then kind of towards that, those points. So I think there's a lot of interest. I think the other place to think about is as states are thinking about their credential list for high school versus credential list for post-secondary versus credential list for under workforce system, thinking about how can you build one single list, use one process for vetting all of those simultaneously rather than have all these competing processes and then being very clear what's appropriate for a high school student. One, what's a, what, what is actually achievable, right, at the end of a pathway and for a student who may not be 18 because many of them you can't even sit for until you're 18. Um, and which ones are, are really more appropriate for adults at different levels um, or for, you know, basic students. Um, you know, individuals getting upskilled, right, versus those that are in high school. So I think there's a one-size-fits-all. I think be, being very intentional on what is appropriate, what's the purpose, what are you trying to signal, um, and looking at those accountability, accountability and incentive system from the state side that you're not accidentally creating the wrong incentives that just have schools saying just get as many credentials as you can and they're not credentials that actually have value. And we, we've seen that, right? We've seen states have to course correct. Florida has, to, has had to course correct many times. They've been at this work for over a decade in terms of incentivizing credentials for schools and for teachers, and have had to keep kind of revising their list and redoing their weights and redoing their guidance um, to make sure that the right credentials are being earned by students. So, yes. Of course, I've got more questions, but we're going to stop and see if you guys have some questions first. And if you don't, I'll go back to some more that I'm on my sheet. But you want to turn the mic? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Susan Sclafani, a former assistant secretary for what was vocational and adult education at the time. Uh, You've talked a lot about connections with the State Department and the, the high school, middle schools. What about the kinds of connections, particularly in San Antonio, to the community college and college programs? You just talked a lot about the credentialing needing to go through there, but how are you building the connections within your programs so that it goes all the way through from middle school to community college or college? So I'm not in the K-12 system, I'm sure maybe Corpus can speak to that, but we are seeing that alignment um, in the case of the Advanced Manufacturing Technician Program, which, which is a community college program um, that um, Toyota actually brought the FAME, the Federation for the Advancement of Manufacturing Education model from their Kentucky plant, and now we're seeing that in San Antonio is they are digging deep into the CTE program, so they're seeing alignment with the CTE programs that will then lead them into this two-year advanced manufacturing technician program. So we're seeing some of that, and we're also seeing some of our school districts also look at dual credit. So in terms of being able to graduate some students with associate's degrees, but then putting them onto pathways to post-secondary. So there are we are seeing some of that industry and post-secondary alignment happening with our CTE programs. I know that for us at the high school level, we're very connected with our Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and our Del Mar College, our junior college that's in our community, college that's in our city. And we just uh, started last year with a University of Texas through a due enrollment um, on RAPS course, courses that our teachers uh, teach in the classroom um, through, um, through UT through UT training and prep. Um, one big deal for us has been for our students to take advanced course credit. And right, this CT program is a, we're gonna do a pathway and it's for the kids not going to college is no longer the case. Now it is, you're getting those CT programs, you'll be taking pre-AP courses, we're gonna be there to support you through them, we're gonna provide the interventions, we're gonna try, provide the tutoring, we're gonna help you to master, be able to master that, the rigor of that type of instruction and that type of study. Um, but yes, for us, it's we don't, it's not that we're saying you're not going to go to college. What we're saying is we're not letting you say, I'm not going to go to college. You may say that, but we want you to leave that if you change your mind, you'll be ready. If you change your mind at the last, at the last stretch and you say, you know what, I am going to go, well, then you're ready and you're prepared and you won't fail while you're there. 
And, and so, yeah, we're, that's, that's a key piece to all of our CTE programs. Every one of them is tied to a pre-AP advanced, uh, advanced uh, placement class or a dual credit or dual enrollment course. And I would say that the Kentucky Community and Technical College system is one of our key partners on everything we do. They're on all of our task force. They're a huge player on our Perkins 5 uh, steering committee that we're putting together or that we have been uh, meeting with. Uh, they're definitely one of our key partners on the New Skills for Youth grant. Uh, all of our models, pathways that we're developing are designed with post-secondary at the table with us. Um, in addition to those, we have articulated credit agreements with post-secondary partners um, so that students going through our programs and meeting certain criteria earn college credit as part of that so that they can go ahead and get part of that degree program out of the way um, regardless of what area it's in. And so that's, that's both in our accountability system and in just our everyday working environment, the way we do things. So post-secondary, uh, we, we can't do anything that we do without post-secondary working with us. So um happy to talk about that more with you, but um, they're key. They are not. Um, the community and technical college system is one system in the Department of Education is another, but um, especially over the last three years, our partnership has gotten really, really strong. So. Hello, Leslie Arst. Um, I um, just saw, as I was sitting here, I lost it now, a new report, uh, here it is, from Ex Excellent Ed, um, and also they've done a, a study in conjunction with Burning Glass Technologies um, that's talking about only, and it just came out, only 19% of credentials earned by K-12 students are demanded by employers. So have you all seen this study? And I wondered if you could comment on it. Uh -huh. Well, I've seen it. I have not read it all, so I will preface that by it did come out just last week. I, I mean, I think that's no surprise. I mean, I think that's not a surprise. I think part of this is there's a, a real challenge, as we've said, in terms of what the right list is. I think equally to the challenge is a lack of signaling from employers and a lack of um, consistency in terms of what they're asking for um, and what's must have versus nice to have versus we never heard of it. Um, a lot of companies, large companies, just build their own credentials, right? So, um, which other companies may or may not pick up. So it's not tremendously surprising. I also think this is a relatively new space. I mean, there's some pathways that, you know, you look at transportation and everyone gets A certified. You look at welding and American Well, or there are some that are very well defined and there's a lot of now attention to kind of create new credentials or match credentials to other pathways that don't exist. And so, it's not surprising um, that there is some misalignment, um, lack, I think lack of signaling, inconsistent lists, um, and then just the gap that not all clusters have a natural credential. Well, I think in the CT. Sorry, I know. I mean, I think within the CT space, no one should be getting a credential that is not taking the coursework. That that is the capstone experience mm -hmm. of that credential, at least for K twelve. I think in the adult space, in the workforce development space, yes. I mean, I know there was a New York Times piece about the coding kind of camps in Appalachia, and these individuals were not able to be hired or be successful. So I think that is really important. Having the credential be a capstone, be tied to that program of study is incredibly important, which has other coursework and ideally has work-based learning and exposure to the workplace, which I know we haven't talked as much about. It came up a little bit in your continuum. So I know you can talk a little bit more about that, but 
yes on those things, but I don't think we're talking about a system where someone just sits down for a credential, gets a credential, and gets hired. Okay. Um, that's kind of hollowing out to the middle of our program. We think pathway first, and then credential kind of as that kind of final piece of that pathway. So you, you can't replace work-based learning with a credential. Um, data shows that that work-based learning component is very, very important in students being able to actually do the job. So I, I don't want to get involved in that discussion too much, but I'll just say straight up that work-based learning is a key component in students being successful um, in, in a career. Uh, a couple of things on the data side, though, um, j just throw out some data for you, Kate. The, the data shows that without the pathway, the credential is almost meaningless. Uh, the, I, I've looked at too much Kentucky data for students who have earned a credential but not been in a pathway and seen that the results are not equal versus a student who's gone through the pathway and earned that credential. There's a huge discrepancy in both employment wages and degree earning after high school. Um, so, so it's not the credential that, that makes the difference there. It's the pathway with the, the ultimate goal of being able to earn a credential and get those work-based learning experiences. Uh, back to the burning glass just a little bit. I've, I've worked with the burning glass data a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, Kate, can't, you, you're so right. There, there's not a whole lot of credentials included in those job postings from employers. And so that makes it incredibly difficult to know what credentials are valuable. Um, and looking at burning glass data, one of the top credentials that's asked for are, are those MOS certifications that so many people want to downgrade. Um, I'm not here to say whether they're great or bad. I'm going to say that in the burning glass data, MOS certifications are asked for a lot um, by employers. Um, but unfortunately, 88, 89% of the job postings uh, that I've looked at in burning glass don't have any credentials in them at all. And so really trying to make sense of what's valuable and what's not from the burning glass data is incredibly difficult. Well, and, and if you look at like our, our STEM engineering program, there isn't a credential other than Autodesk or Microsoft Office that they can get. But what our employers are looking for, and even when they go on and they've hired them on for, we'll get some kids graduate of high school and make $80,000 a year if they're hired as an operator in our petrochemical industry. And what that industry is looking at is how many, how many years did they study? Did they study introduction to engineering their freshman year, principles of engineering their second year? Um, did they do uh, engineering design and development their senior year? And what type of work-based experiences did they have with our mentors? Those are critical. And, and you take out their, there's no credential tied to that that's going to get them other than your OSHA 10-hour, which really anyone can do. I agree with you on that one. Um, but we'll take it. And so, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's about that four-year pathway of learning. It's that foundation of that background knowledge it's going to take them much further than, than the credential that's tied to it and they'll they'll attain that credential having had that four-year path with that four-year path that comes first I, I should say that we stack a lot of the credentials in Kentucky just just FYI because they are not end of program assessments they are maybe end of course or maybe end of 10 weeks maybe end of 10 hour and so stand if they're a standalone on our list it's because the assessment covers the entire pathway, um, but otherwise they, they are stacked and um, they would not count for accountability unless they earn multiple certifications in those areas. Hi, I'm Kathy Hughes. I'm with the American Institutes for Research and I'm also the principal investigator of the new federally funded CTE Research Network. Just to give that a plug, look us up online. Um, so Dr. Clement, you said that the cost of, of sitting for these exams for these certifications has gone up quite a bit. And so my question is, who's paying for that? Are the students paying for it? Is it coming out of your high school budget? Does the state have a pot of money for this? And I don't know, Kate, if you know across the you know 20 plus states that are including this in their accountability system, Systems, it, what, what the funding is for this. For us at the high school level, our CTE department does, it does come out of our CTE budget. So it is eating up more of that budget that we could use for instruction because it's part of their pathway and part of their instruction and required as part of their graduation program. So therefore, we fund that um, for them. We make sure that they're prepared. They've taken a lot of tests before, pre-test, to make sure that they're probably a sure path. We have very, very few students that may not. Like right now, we've got our kids that took their uh, CNA certificate. It's a national exam for CNA. And so I had maybe two that barely missed it. So out of those two out of 40, 
you know, pretty good. Uh, but we go back, we reteach, and, and, and it's repaid for. And so um, it, it's things like that. But yes, it's, the, the cost is taken on bar CTE funds. Yes, ma'am. I don't have, I mean, I don't have a definitive number. It varies from state to state. I mean, sometimes they'll use Perkins funds, they'll use state funds. Um, sometimes they'll pass it down to districts and require them to do it. Um, I've seen states pass it to districts, but then have a separate pool, use the reserve funds from Perkins to kind of offset that cost. Sometimes it is passed to students. That does happen for sure. Yeah. Um, I saw one school that had a student, a school-based enterprise where like, through their work-based learning, they were, I can't remember what they were selling, but they were selling something. They were, you know, whatever, creating, doing construction and selling. And they were using that money they raised to pay for credentials, which was amazing, but also heartbreaking <laughs> that was putting the cost on them. Um, so I think it really varies. And as they grow, I mean, I think the hope is as they grow, you could have some economies of scale and you could have states going in together and broker better deals. That is really disheartening to hear that they are raising the prices. Um, that is that is the first time I've heard that explicitly in connection to it being put in accountability because it should really be the opposite, right? If there's more the assessments being held, then the states have more buying power. And so that's how it should be working. But I have made a note of that already. That's <laughs> novel and new and hopefully someone, yes, takes care of that. <laughs> So I can only speak for us, but school school districts can use up to 25% of their Perkins allocation in, in our state to pay for industry certs. Uh, we provided $1.8 million of state funds to school districts this year to use for free reduced, free reduced lunch students to take industry certifications. Uh, we've got several foundations around the state that uh, pay for those industry certs for districts. But even in my own state, it varies from district to district to district. Some can afford to pay for them. Um, some get enough funding through us to pay for all of them. Some have to um, come up with the money or have students pay for their own industry certifications. So it varies even within one state as to how those things are being paid for. But we do try um, to provide funding for them so that it doesn't get down to the student level. Unfortunately, in some cases, it still does. Good question. Hi there, uh, Kyle Duarte. I'm uh, based here in DC, but currently working on a project in Iowa. Um, as you may know, Iowa has the lowest unemployment rate in the country at the moment and a high manufacturing industry. Um, what the state is looking to do is to uh, create stopgap programs where they're looking at communities where workforce participation has traditionally been very low. So people with disabilities, um, re-entering citizens coming out of uh, incarcerated situations. Have you seen any success with these types of boot camp type programs that are looking to fill gaps when we're waiting for students to come through the pipeline? Sorry, it's, it's a little less, it's a little less than a, wheel, a wheelhouse. I mean, we often focus on the K-12 and post-secondary system, so those are usually more in the workforce system. Um, I mean, certainly, I, I don't know, I, the boot camps, I think there's a lot of, I, I'm not gonna get into that. I think there's, the, it, the research is still out kind of on the impact of that. I mean, I think there is good research on, you know, things more like the integrated education training models in terms of how can you take lower skilled, you know, adults with missing basic education, not um, have, you know, not having passed their, their high school diploma, not having basic literacy skills, not um, being an English language learner, and braiding some of those basic skills with um, contextualized training that has been incredibly successful. I'm sure that's something you've been looking at, and, and Iowa probably has some of those. So that is a proven model that has a lot of research behind it. Um, and they can be up to a two-year associate, or they can also be very short-term, but really intentional at pairing kind of those additional support services with the, you know, the CT teacher um, or workforce development that can actually put that in context. So that's the one place I can speak to that we've, I've seen the research and really feel strongly and positive about it. I don't know if there's other things you've done with Kentucky or seen. I, I, I can't speak to your exact question, but I, but I can tell you the approach we're taking with employers to fill those gaps, which is our pre-apprenticeship programs, our high school apprenticeship programs. So uh, partnering with employers, they choose the courses that they want to see students take. They provide that work-based learning experience to them towards the end of their junior or senior year. And so that's filling those, those gaps in, in those um, 
you know, it, it's not the boot camp program, it's, it's not the stopgap programs, but it is a proven model, our apprenticeship program, our track program, just give it a plug there, um, is a proven model that works. Um, the, student, the companies are uh, seeing a lot of success with that. They're filling their workforce needs through that, but, um, but, but specific to, the, to your question, no, I don't, I don't have the knowledge there. So this has been fantastic. I see that we are at time. Uh, before we thank our panel, I just want to thank a few folks uh, here at Fordham that helped to pull this event together because our events coordinator left recently and it's been quite a scramble. But uh, just a quick shout out to Victoria McDougall, Rachel Halterbach, Jesse McBurney, John Lutton, Andrew Scanlon, Sophie Sussman, and Madison Yoner. That is a small army that took this. When one person leaves, you guys know in your organizations, one person leaves like, oh my gosh, and all these people pitched in. So thank you to them. But more importantly, Let's thank this five-person panel, which is a spectacular today. <laughs> thank you guys for coming. Really appreciate you um, spending some time with us today.